Good morning, this is Faith of Faith and Books. Um, I'm going to do my Maze for Magazine, which I did not do yesterday. I'm working through McClure's, and I'm focusing on Ida M. Tarbell, who was an early woman uh, journalist, investigative reporter, who wrote the book that kind of um, exposed Standard Oil and, and uh, ushered in um, sort of the muckraking policies of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, so, uh, this is the second installment. It's December 1902. And uh, that is not related. That is uh, Albert Durer. Yeah. <laughs> they always have an art exhibit, uh, not exhibit, an art appreciation article. It's, it's a regular feature of the magazine. Anyway, McClure's Magazine, December 1902. Ida Tarbell has her second chapter on the history of the Standard Oil Company, and she is exposing uh, John Rockefeller and his nefarious practices. So um, she talks about the... So the oil business was... Um, you know, it was it 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 came on the scene all of a sudden, and the the independent oil uh, companies, businesses uh, in along Oil Creek, um, and the Allegheny River in that area, of Pennsylvania, popped up really quickly, and it, it took only ten or twelve years before they were really established, and they had established oil uh, because it was used for lighting, um, as a, a really profitable market. So, but Cleveland, the city of Cleveland was geographically located in a place that there were, they could um, ship the oil to and then they could have the refineries there. So Cleveland began to make money off of having refineries. And uh, somebody from Cleveland was Rockefeller and he was, um, he was a businessman who had started off as a clerk and then um, he was very, very savvy. He was absolutely obsessed with making money, you know, making a profit. He, one thing I read, and apparently this was something people did, but still, I think it's just about the most unmanly thing is that instead of going to fight in the Civil War, he paid a substitute to go for him. Now, that's not brought up in this magazine. I, I was uh, doing research outside of, like, some history site but you know and so he, what he did was because the the price of produce was going up he had a produce kind of brokerage company and so he was making money off of that so he so somebody you, you don't know what happened to the poor substitute what was his name did he get killed what happened um but you know that freed mr rockefeller to stay at home and you know support the cause by making a lot of money off of produce um, so he, so, and he was a very good businessman. He was very, very frugal and he had very, very good sense about how to save a buck here and there and um, uh, a lot of drive, very smart. And so he had made some money for himself and then he um, got started to get involved in the oil industry. And so, um, he and his partner, whose name is suddenly escaping me, um, bought this company called the South Improvement Company. It was it was in liquidation, but it had a where is that? It had the um, it had rights. Oh shoot! I really should. Uh, it's for some reason it had certain rights and so it it um allowed them to contract with the railroads and i think that was it anyway i might be muddling things um but what happened was he wound up um getting uh, the big scheme was that because rockefeller was good at marketing all aspects of oil better than other companies who were just sort of um, selling it for the kerosene or whatever, he figured out petroleum jelly and, and other byproducts um, of the refining system that he could sell. And so, and because he was so frugal and so savvy and so, you know, always looking to 
make another dollar, that he started providing the railroad companies with the most money. His, his contracts were more lucrative for the railroad companies. And so, um, so the other, the other oil refinery companies started noticing that he was making lots more money than they were, and they couldn't figure it out. And it turned out that the railroads had connived with him because he was providing more business. They would give him a rebate, so he was doing more at a cheaper price, so he could afford to do more. Whereas the other people were paying much higher prices for the shipping of the um, their oil on the on the railroad, and so um, they kind of when they found out about that, they weren't too happy. Um, <clears throat> so how does she phrase it here? Um, Says so something, isn't it? Isn't it for um, all? public, you know, isn't it a public servant? Shouldn't it? Uh, yeah, ship as large a quantity. It was a new principle in railroad policy. Were not the railroads public servants? Were they not bound as common carriers to carry 10 barrels at the same rate per barrel as they did 100? If they were not, what was to become of the 10 barrel man? Could they live? So, um, so Rockefeller got it into his head that how could he get, because he was very insecure about the, um, you know, the stability of the whole thing because other people could start, I guess it wasn't that hard to um, build a refinery and things could shift easily. It's, it wasn't stable. And so he was trying to figure out, well, how do we make it so that we're always making money like this? And so he thought, well, what I need to do is own everything. I need to own all aspects of the oil industry. And that way, if I don't have any competitors, then, um, then I don't have to worry about competition. So, uh, so that was his thinking. And so he started conspiring with other people, with railroad people and with other, his partners. And there was this whole um, group of men not only from Cleveland, but also Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, that got together and they, they had to sign a contract to be quiet because um, the railroad knew it wasn't supposed to be doing what it was doing with him. Um, and so it was crooked from the beginning. Um, but let's see, here's an example of one of the contracts they had to sign uh, for secrecy in this deal that they were putting together. The undersigned pledge their solemn words of honor that they will not communicate to anyone without permission of, and then you put name of the director of Southern Improvement Company, which was sort of his, his, um, you know, facade company for all this, any information that he may convey to them or say of them in relation to the Southern Improvement Company. And then you signed it. So, so they had to sign to secrecy this plan that they were doing, and then they got together and they, they figured out how to control the whole process of, of, you know, getting the oil shipped to them and then refining it and then selling it. And in fact, in this contract that he had with the railroads, the, um, the railroads had to, part of the contract was that they had to tell the uh, uh, Southern um, Improvement Company what the other companies were shipping. That was part of their deal. Um, so an, inter, an interesting provision in the contracts was that full way bills of all petroleum shipped over the road should each day be sent to the South Improvement Company. It keep, kept changing its name. Sometimes it was Southern, and sometimes it was South. This, of course, gave them knowledge of just what was doing, bus just who was doing business outside of their company, of how much business he was doing and with whom he was doing it. Not only were they to have full knowledge of the business of all the shippers, they were to have access to the books of the railroad so they could go in and look at the railroad's own books to see who, who was uh, selling what. So anyway, here's all the conspirators, here's, uh, all these men getting together to, um, to conspire against the smaller, um, the smaller companies. So I'll just read the very last paragraph. She goes very much into detail, the whole economics, the cost of everything. She breaks everything down. Um, and I'll just read this last 
paragraph of this. What time? Oh, it's 10 minutes. Okay. Pretty soon. Okay. I mean, I'm going fast. All right. Uh, while Mr. Rockefeller was working out the good of the oil business in Cleveland, his associates were busy at other points. A little more time and the great scheme would be an accomplished fact. And then there fell in its path two of those never-to-be-foreseen human elements which so often block great maneuvers. The first was born of a man's anger. The man had learned of the scheme. He wanted to go into it, but the directors were suspicious of him. He had been concerned in speculative enterprises and in dealings with the Erie Road, which had injured these directors in other days. They didn't want him to have any of the advantages of their great enterprise. When convinced that he could not share in the deal, he took his revenge by telling people in the oil regions what was going on. At first, the oil regions refused to believe, but in a few days, another slip born of human weakness came in to prove the rumor true. The schedule of rates agreed upon by the South Improvement Company and the railroads had been sent to the freight agent of the Lakeshore Railroad, but no order had been given to put them in force. The freight agent had a son on his deathbed. Distracted by his sorrow, he left his office in charge of subordinates, but neglected to tell them that the new schedules on his desk were a secret compact, whose effectiveness depended upon their being held until all was complete. On February 26, the subordinates, ignorant of the nature of the rates, put them into effect. The independent oil men heard with amazement that freight rates had been put up nearly 100%. They needed no other proof of the truth of the rumors of conspiracy which were circulating. It now remained to be seen whether the oil regions would submit to the South Improvement Company as Cleveland had to the Standard Oil Company. So anyway, it, it's complicated. She explains it. Well, I can't say I was focusing 100% on the uh, gory details of numbers and such and, and how they plan to do it through contracts and that sort of thing. It was very interesting, and um, I guess I'll get to the next chapter um, on Monday um, if all goes as it's supposed to. It's going to be a really busy, crazy weekend. So kind of starting today. So anyway, my chickens survived the night. Uh, I was really worried about that. They are now eating and drinking. They were kind of traumatized that so they weren't eating and drinking. Uh, but they seem pretty happy now. So um, I guess I'll talk to you later. Bye.